Hi, and welcome to our first lecture in financial risk management. Um, after having talked about the course organization and the outline of this class, um, today we'll start our discussion of financial risk management. And most importantly, we'll start with a small definition of what risk management really is, um, what the risk management process looks like, and we'll shortly talk about the necessity um, of managing financial risk because as you will see later on uh, you can ask yourself the question should we do risk management at all um, now from an economic standpoint uh, you could argue and you could make the um, case that financial risk management is costly um, it will cost the company money um, you will have uh, to put in some effort and the question is is this cost are these costs and is this effort justified and um, yes, you can show that actually there is a positive um, uh, effect, there is a benefit to financial risk management, at least for some companies. And that's why if the benefits outweigh the costs, yes, you should engage in financial risk management. But this isn't uh, clear um, from the start from a theoretical standpoint. We can just observe that many companies, especially financial institutions, engage in financial risk management. And we as financial economists have to ask ourselves, is this behavior by firms justified or are managers simply wasting um, shareholder value? Are they wasting the um, shareholders money? But actually, uh, you can make the case and you can show theoretically and empirically that, um, yes, it's a good thing to engage in financial risk management. So let's start with our discussion. Um, and uh, I brought you um, this extract from a German newspaper, um, actually 12 years ago from Focus Online. Um, which is about HSH Nordbank, Hasa Nordbank. Uh, you probably don't remember this case, but this was one of the most prominent um, defaults or near defaults during the financial crisis um, in Germany. Um, HSH Nordbank um, is and was a state-owned bank, uh, a Landesbank, as we call them in German, um, a state-owned bank um, in the possession of the states of Schleswig-Holstein and uh, the city of Hamburg. And HSH Nordbank uh, famously went near bankrupt um, and nearly defaulted during the financial crisis. And had, it had to be bailed out by the two states, by the two owners. And um, as you can see from this newspaper article, German, um, it states that the um, uh, certified public accountants uh, KPMG, uh, they um, were brought in during the financial crisis to assess um, to assess the problems in the bank that caused it uh, to nearly default. And what they found is that the risk management, we don't really know what it is yet, but they criticized the risk management heavily in the uh, bank. Um, and uh, they actually stated that um, um, the risk management in place was absolutely insufficient um, for a bank of such a size. So they nearly defaulted, like many other companies, many other banks and insurance companies, but Haas Hamlet Bank was uh, one of the most severe cases and was also a very severe case because it was a state-owned bank. So the state should have known better and auditors um, identified a number of violations of the bank's minimum risk management requirements. Actually, minimum risk management requirements, we'll come back to this later on. In German, we call this Mindestanforderung an das Risikomanagement or MA risk. This is something peculiar to financial institutions. Um, but it suffices to say at this point that banks need to fulfill at least a minimum set of risk management principles um, for the bank to be allowed to operate, at least in Germany. Now, what did they do? Actually, according to a different news magazine, Stern, uh, the violations um, were um, that the auditors and also supervisors found um, included the following. They had insufficient monitoring systems, um, most notably in their trading department. They had incorrect valuation methods. If you remember this during the great financial crisis, uh, the great financial crisis centered around um, so-called toxic assets, uh, to be more precise, um, um, 
securitized um, debt instruments, securitized uh, loans, especially in the subprime loan segment in the United States. Um, and one key problem in many banks was that uh, these instruments, these financial assets had been mispriced, has, had been misvalued. So banks thought they were um, actually worth a lot. Um, they were uh, accounted for in the balance sheet uh, with high prices. Um, but during the um, financial crisis, uh, banks had to find out actually that many of these instruments were not as valuable as the banks thought them to be. So they had incorrect valuation methods in the key risk controlling instruments. And um, the HSA Nord Bank actually incurred losses of approximately 100 million euros due to various weaknesses in the risk management process. And there was some with other banks, for example, like um, uh, Hypo Real Estate, um, there were many, many famous examples of insufficient risk management processes. Most notably, there was one case where one bank actually wired a couple of hundred million euros to an already bankrupt bank. So they wired, uh, they transferred, uh, um, I think, one or 200 million euros. Um, and actually, <laughs> the money was gone instantly because the, the receiver, the receiving bank, uh, had already filed for bankruptcy. So these were some very, very interesting cases during the financial crisis where you could see that um, some uh, processes um, and some uh, management functions uh, within the bank were insufficient um, to save the bank, to save the company from certain risks. And you can now probably see what risk management is probably about. So next, we need to define risk management and we need, to, first of all, we need to have a good definition of risk in order to be able to define risk management. So what is your definition of risk? Um, again, if you, wanna, if you want uh, to uh, be recorded, um, you, can, um, you can start your microphone if you're okay with this uh, being recorded and probably put up on YouTube later on. You probably will not be recorded by my microphone, but um, you can write it in the, in the chat window uh, and we'll um, have a look at this later on. Um, maybe um, let's start with our definition of risk. Um, this is even a philosophical one. Um, risk um, can be um, the danger of losing something. It can be uh, the danger of incurring um, an injury, of incurring a loss. Um, and this lecture here, this class is called financial risk management. So it's natural that uh, we focus on financial risk, whatever that may be. Um, to be more specific, uh, risk for a company, especially for a financial institution, is usually uh, thought of as a financial loss. So it's the risk of incurring a financial loss, of losing money. Um, for this to happen, we need uncertainty about the likelihood of possible um, environmental conditions. Um, as a result, uncertainty of achieving certain goals, uncertainty of uh, reaching certain milestones, maybe. It is usually a deviation of a parameter from its expected target value, but um, to make it more precise in any financial risk management class, I guess, not just this class, it's usually a random negative deviation of some financial variables from previously defined reference values of asset positions. So you have an asset position, you have an investment, you were expecting this investment to be worth a certain amount of money um, and any deviation from this expected value um, is thought of as a financial risk. You can lose money, you can incur financial loss. Now it's interesting to discuss this, let me highlight this, um, to discuss this question of a negative um, random deviation. Um, you can also make the case that um, a positive deviation could also be a risk, but we'll discuss this. So what characteristics of risk do we have? First of all, it needs to be random. If it's deterministic, 
um, you don't have risk. It's, it's a result and you need to include this in your um, financial planning. Um, actually, in German, we say that um, this wird in die Planung übernommen. Das wird in die Bilanz und Finanzplanung übernommen. This simply means that as soon as you have um, a financial loss and you are certain about um, the fact that you will incur this loss, so as soon as it's no longer random, you need um, to account for this um, in your balance sheet and to include it in your income statement. If it's still random, you need to deal with this uh, in risk management. It should be a negative deviation and will concentrate on negative deviations most of the time. But the question is whether some positive deviation, so a, a random uh, profit, a random positive um, um, deviation from an expected value, could also uh, signal risk. That's on the next slide. It should be financial. Um, why? Because this is financial risk management with a heavy focus on financial institutions but also energy companies at some point. Um, but in the end, you need to put a dollar figure to any risk. If it's too vague, if you think, well, I could lose some money, but it could also simply be a risk to my reputation that uh, will not change my uh, profit, then this is not financial and uh, this is more of a strategic risk. And strategic risks are usually not included in financial risk management. I can give you um, um, a very good example actually from, from uh, the um, energy sector. If you look at energy companies, you will often see, uh, in contrast to financial uh, institutions, banks, insurance companies, that energy companies will um, measure risks and they will say that um, um, some situation or some event uh, should be dealt with in risk management as soon as it might have randomness, as it might have an effect on the company's annual profit. So as soon as it has an effect or could have an effect on the company's profit at the end of the year in the income statement, if it's financial, then it's a risk that should be managed by risk management. If it does not have an effect, a potential effect on the company's profit, um, then it shouldn't be dealt in financial risk management. Um, sehen Sie relativ häufig, gerade bei den um, Energieversorgungsunternehmen, die, die messen Risiken in der Form, dass sie sagen, gibt es eine Bilanzwirksamkeit? Gibt es eine Ergebniswirksamkeit ähm, in der G&V? Wenn ja, Risikomanagement. Wenn nein, muss ich das Risikomanagement nicht damit beschäftigen. And ideally, risk should be measurable. If it's not measurable, you have a problem, you can still deal with it in financial risk management, but it makes things a lot more difficult. To give you um, um, a better understanding of this question whether we should focus on negative deviations or financial potential financial losses, I can give you two counterexamples. The first one is very interesting. We'll come to this uh, a couple of times during the class. It's the case of British investment bank Barings Bank. Now, it was very old, uh, um, highly famous um, investment bank. Uh, founded uh, in the 18th century, and in 1995, it went bankrupt overnight. Uh, and what happened is, um, Barings Bank had um, what we call a rogue trader. Uh, a trader, a person who works in the trading department of a bank, a, a trader who um, acts illegally or maybe against... Um, against uh, the regulations, the internal regulations of the company. So this rogue trader uh, did the following. Many rogue traders do this, actually. They keep two separate accounts, one account for the profits and one for the losses. So uh, he put all these profits uh, from his trading, um, from his transactions in one account. He reported, Nick Leeson was the name of this rogue trader, he reported these profits to his superiors and he kept the losses hidden from his superiors. So what happened is, uh, because his superiors only saw the high profits, he was thought of as being the star trader. He was promoted and in the end he was uh, the chief derivatives trader, I think, for uh, Barings Bank in the Singapore office. 
he got promoted, his limits were set higher and higher and higher, and he engaged in even more risky transactions because he saw that he got promoted, he got a higher salary, um, and no one thought uh, of the potential losses. And what happened is, um, in this case, and that's why we'll come back to this, something unexpected happened. Um, in 1995, uh, we saw the Great Hanshin earthquake in uh, Kobe and Osaka in Japan. And this earthquake uh, started uh, the Asian crisis of the 90s. So all markets, all financial markets in the mid 90s, they all went down heavily uh, due to this earthquake in Japan. And um, Nick Leeson was no longer able to hide his losses. So what he did is he packed his bag and he fled Singapore and he was arrested at Frankfurt Airport and extradited to the UK. The bank, however, was bankrupt overnight. They realized that when he fled, the, uh, when he fled Singapore, uh, that actually one single person, this rogue trader, Nick Leeson, he caused almost $1.4 billion in losses and the bank was bankrupt. So what happened? The company should have realized at some point if you only if you have one person who is only reporting profit after profit after profit, it's too good to be true. And they should have realized that something's off. That's why I would argue that not only negative but also positive deviations are probably uh, something that should make you think that something is off. The second case is actually very current uh, right now because Bernie Madoff died, I think, last week or two weeks ago. Uh, Bernie Madoff, um, famously uh, the operator of the largest uh, illegal Ponzi scheme in the USA. Uh, Ponzi scheme is what we call in English, uh, that's the English word for the German uh, Schneeball system. What uh, Bernie Madoff did is um, he started, um, I think, an investment fund he attracted customers who invested in his fund and instead of investing the money of clients, he took, for example, the first million and he paid out his previous investors, telling them, oh, look, um, I made 10, 12, 15 percent profit. He reported this to potentially uh, to potential other investors and they thought, wow, 15 percent interest, 15 uh, percent return. This is a very good investment fund. So new people kept investing into his fund and he took the money that was invested, the inflows to his fund and paid out the previous um, investors. And he never invested this money and he kept this Ponzi scheme going for, I think, 10, 15 years. And in the end, you can see he caused an, a loss of almost 65 billion US dollars. Uh, what happened is the financial crisis in 2008-2009 hit and everyone wanted out. Everyone wanted to uh, divest from this uh, fund and there was simply no money left. The $65 billion were gone and uh, you can see even the statement of a whistleblower what should have tipped off investors. The biggest tip off of a fraud was that Madoff reported his fund was down only three months out of 87 whereas the S&P 500 was down 28 months. Again, something is too good to be true and you should be suspicious to make sure that, well, um, um, you keep an eye out for potential losses, for potential risk. So we will concentrate on negative deviations, on financial losses, losses and not profits. But again, keep in mind that uh, something might be fishy, something might be too good to be true. Okay, so if we know that um, potential financial losses um, are our prime concern here in financial risk management, the question is how should we measure financial risk? And just to give you an idea of what can be done uh, for a very simple investment uh, like the S&P 500 composite, yeah, um, I want to show you some pictures and some plots here. Now, this is um, a plot from uh, data stream, and it shows you the uh, the evolution of the S and P 500 between 1995 and 2015. As you can see clearly, we have the financial crisis here. 
Uh, this is the dot-com crisis and uh, the uh, September 11. Um, and this is the period where um, the S&P 500 recovered um, and also um, how it um, developed during the policy, uh, the zero interest policy of most uh, central banks after the financial crisis. Um, if you continue this, you will probably also see the big uh, uh, crisis of COVID and then uh, the quick recovery. So it will probably look like this uh, if you were to continue this. Now, this is the price. Uh, this is the price index. Um, the question now is, do we see risk? Well, we see the crisis here, but how should we measure this? Uh, the natural idea next is to look at the volatility of the S&P 500. Now, for the S&P 500, it's very nice because we have this uh, so-called VIX, the volatility index that is actually traded, and uh, you, can, you can buy and sell, you can invest in the volatility of the S&P 500, and this is the VIX. You could also calculate the volatility yourself, but actually in this case it's very convenient that you can simply look at the um, volatility index of the S&P 500. So, okay, we again can see the dot-com crisis, we can see the financial crisis here, uh, where volatility sparked, um, but volatility is an indication of risk, but it will also um, look at profits and losses in the same way. In the same way. Uh, so profits and losses are both considered in volatility, probably not the best way to measure risk. What we can do is, next, this is again the price index uh, now um, uh, uploaded to R. Uh, we can calculate the log returns. Um, the log returns again show you we have a period of increased volatility here, so more risk here, we have the financial crisis here. Um, and relatively calm periods here and here. Okay, so log returns show you financial losses, profits and losses, but what should we do next? Uh, we can take the absolute returns, gives you a similar picture to volatility. Um, that's the volatility, you can see basically the same picture, um, but you can also take the log returns and you can first of all concentrate on the financial losses and then you can say, well, I'm only interested in those losses that are pretty bad, that are existentially dangerous uh, for the company and you take the log returns and you uh, only look at those log returns that lie below the 5% quantile. For those of you who right now are asking yourself, what is a quantile? Well, if this is the distribution of those profits and losses, a quantile is, for example, a point here on the x-axis, so that you can say, well, let me use this. For example, if this is the 5% quantile, we can say that we have 5% probability here, well, and 95% in the remaining space, uh, the distribution. So this point here, this is the point that separates 5% probability mass from 95. Well, let's write the 9 here. 95 from 5%. So that's the quantile, the 5% quantile, and then these um, returns, all these returns here, those are the log returns that lie below the 5% quantile. So that's a pretty nice idea how to look at extreme losses, extremely dangerous log returns. And you can see, for example, here, this is a daily loss of almost 10%. 10% doesn't sound too much, but um, if you're an investor and you can see here, we have almost 5% here, 10% uh, here, 10% here, 10% here, you can imagine that um, in this, uh, in, on these couple of days, you probably lost half of your money. 
So if you had $100 invested, this small area here, this short period of time during the financial prices probably reduced those $100 to 50. So that's, that's a huge loss. You can also say, okay, let's not look at the 5% quantile. Let's look at the more moderate losses. And you can see you are now including this area here where you have, sorry, where you have those returns that lie between the 5 and 10%. That's probably 10% quantile. So you're now adding this area and have more moderate losses here. And you can also do the same with the 90% quantile and the 95% quantile. Now you're going up here. For example, that's probably the 95% quantile. Now you're looking at profits. Is this a good idea? Maybe you can ask yourself, why do we have a high profit here, a high daily profit? Um, that's probably uh, a day on which the S&P 500 rebounds. Uh, rebounded and uh, recovered from this huge loss on this day. Okay, so a very simple um, financial instrument, financial investment, the S&P 500, and you can look at the prices, you can look at the log returns, you can look at a quantile, you could, can look at volatilities, absolute returns, and so on and so on. And we'll, during the class, we'll see many uh, hopefully sophisticated ways um, how to measure financial risk for different investments but it's not as simply uh, as that that we can just say okay let's take the profits and losses let's look at the potential losses and we are done uh, we need measures of risk uh, calculated on the basis usually of profits and losses um, of potential um, financial losses um, to make a statement of what risk we are exposed to as a company so that's risk. So after having talked about what is risk, we need to talk about risk management and what risk management is and what it does it try to achieve. Risk management, as any management, um, is usually defined as, if, it, if you want to define it in very general terms, you do have a problem. You have a problem. You want to define and measure the problem you want to define and come up with potential solutions to this problem, then you need to decide on the best cause of action to solve this problem. And then you need, after having decided, you need to take action and check whether your action was successful. That's management in marketing, in finance, uh, in uh, management, accounting, in accounting, etc. So it's management is always the same. It's you have a problem, uh, you think about this problem, you need to assess the problem, come up with potential solutions, make a decision, and then um, think about if this decision was right. In risk management, you can now think uh, what risk management should look like. It's defined as the sum of all measures for systematically identifying fi financial risks, measuring financial risk, then managing financial risk, meaning that you come up with solutions how to deal with risk, how to reduce financial risks. And then you need to check whether your action was successful. If you think about what is the primary goal in the, um, what this primary goal of financial risk management, you can think about many things like reducing financial risk minimizing financial losses and so on and so on. But what you really think in the end is, well, it's all related to shareholder value. Um, so the primary goal has to be stabilizing or ideally increasing shareholder value of the company, because in the end, you want to prevent the company from incurring financial losses and a financial loss will reduce shareholder value. So everything you do in risk management will have an effect on shareholder value, and this should be a positive one. At this point, we do not know whether risk management in practice, in reality, really increases shareholder value. It's, this is just a theoretical idea that if there is something like risk management, and if any company thinks about introducing risk management, it should make this decision based on the fact whether it stabilizes or increases shareholder value. If you see that 
let's make a let's make a quick example. Um, for example, a company that um, produces shoes, a shoe manufacturing company. Does this company need risk management, financial risk management? Well, think about this. They are producing shoes. They need some resources, some commodities, um, but probably commodities that are not exposed to market price fluctuations. Leather is, I guess, the price for shoe leather is relatively constant over time. Um, and they're selling their shoes nationally and prices will be, remain stable. So is there any financial risk to this company? Probably not. And they're selling the shoes to customers. Customers have to pay immediately. So there's no temporal lag between delivery and payment. So the company does not have credit risk like a bank, for example. So there's really no financial risk to this company. Why should the shoe manufacturing company now in, uh, introduce uh, a sophisticated risk management department? They would only be spending a lot of money on personnel, on risk managers, if there is no positive effect on shareholder value. So a shoe manufacturing company probably doesn't have risk management. Totally different situation for energy companies, insurance companies and banks, but you need uh, to make this decision whether to introduce risk management on based on the question whether you can see a positive impact on shareholder value. Okay. Risk management is a continuous process. You cannot simply do risk management once and be done with it, but you need to do this all the time. You need to continue doing risk management all the time, and it's a central management task that usually cannot be delegated. Many things in a company can be delegated or can actually even be outsourced. But risk management is something that you will most likely, um, you will not outsource this to another company. You cannot simply leave this to consultants, but you need to do this yourself because it's a part of um, management. Okay. Then we have defined risk management, we've talked about risk, and we've seen that risk management is the identification, measurement, management, and uh, the backtesting and control um, and, and checking the accuracy of risk management. So that's actually already the risk management process. We need to identify risk, we need to assess the potential risk exposure, we need to manage our identified risk, we have risk control, um, so how well have the risks been handled, what needs to be changed, and also we need to communicate our results within our company, so to internal stakeholders, but also to external addressees. So let's talk about each uh, of these steps in more detail. The first step is identification. Uh, we can distinguish internal and external risks. For example, external risks are market price fluctuations, weather changes. If you're an energy company, you're obviously exposed to uh, the risk that it gets too warm, too cold, so you have more or less energy that will be um, required by your customers uh, and more energy that will be produced, for example, by offshore um, wind platforms. Um, you might also have internal sources of risk, for example, if some of your employees, if you have a rogue trader, if you have an employee who steals money from you, that's an internal risk. Um, you need to decide which risks are relevant and which are significant. Uh, for example, it might be that you have a small risk exposure if something happens. Um, for example, let me think about something well, um, that this table breaks down. Um, it's definitely a risk. Is it a significant risk? No, because probably it will only cost $100 or 100 euros to replace this uh, table. So it's not significant. Um, and most companies have a threshold um, when identifying potential financial risk. And they say that if it is above, let's say, 30,000 euros, it is a significant risk that will be monitored in risk management in the risk management function or risk management department. If it has, uh, if it is less than um, worth 30,000 euros, it is insignificant and you will only maybe make a note of it and say, okay, I only have to check whether 
it increases uh, with respect um, to its financial impact. Um, numerous risks are usually known. For example, if you have a bank, if you have a financial institution, banks grant loans. So if a loan defaults, you know a bank always have always will always have credit risk and credit risk exposure. Sometimes, however, risks are not known beforehand, and you need to identify these. Um, one very unfortunate but pretty um, good example in this respect is the Fukushima Daiichi uh, nuclear power plant uh, disaster. Um, the engineers who built Fukushima Daiichi, um, they knew that Japan all the time experiences earthquakes. So the nuclear power plant is earthquake proof. Uh, it was built to withstand earthquakes. What they didn't realize is that they put the emergency power supply <laughs> in the basement. And they didn't realize that the earthquake could also happen in the ocean, causing a tsunami wave. And the tsunami wave could then hit the power plant. And because the power supply for the cooling system is in the basement and it's not above ground, could be flooded, leading to the cascade of errors and, and problems that in the end caused the nuclear meltdown. You had the earthquake in the ocean, you had the tsunami wave, the, um, uh, the power plant was located at the ocean, at the sea, so it was hit by the tsunami wave, the emergency power supply failed, and then they had no energy and they had no cooling system uh, and no backup system, I guess, for that uh, situation. And cooling system failed, nuclear meltdown. So, yes, they knew an earthquake could be a problem. So they had that risk monitored and they accounted for that risk exposure. But again, the different related risk of a tsunami, tsunami wave was not known or at least not managed well. So risk identification can be um, the first step of um, actually dealing sufficiently with risk. No? Okay. Uh, risk measurement is the second step in the risk management process. Um, you have to measure or evaluate all previously identified risks. You can use quantitative risk management that is usually based on statistical, financial, mathematical, and actuarial methods, or you can use qualitative risk management. This can simply be that you ask your engineers, do we have the risk of a tsunami wave? And if your engineers tell you, yes, this is actually a problem, you can go through the process and if uh, you don't need to calculate, you don't need to quantify the risk. I mean, for a nuclear meltdown, it's pretty clear that it's going to be quite costly. But if your engineers realize, okay, we have this danger of a tsunami wave and the wave and the water could flood our emergency cooling system, the simple solution would be, let's introduce a second backup system. Let's put the backup system somewhere else so that this backup system can still operate even in the case of a large tsunami wave. You don't need to quantify the risk meaning that you can put a, a dollar figure to a meltdown. It's probably up in the billions and billions of uh, dollars. You don't need to quantify this risk, but um, qualitative risk management will suffice to tell you that, okay, this is a pretty heavy risk. Uh, it could lead to a meltdown and we need to do something about this. So that's risk measurement. In the next step in risk management, uh, in the strict sense, um, you need to think about how to deal with these previously identified risk. You need to choose suitable countermeasures, actions, how to um, deal with these risks. And the first one could simply be risk avoidance. Risk avoidance in the case of, let's say you want to invest in a stock, could simply be don't buy it. Don't do the transaction, don't close the deal. Um, you simply avoid the risk altogether. Next step could be risk reduction. You can hedge, you can diversify in several asset classes and you will reduce risk by hedging or diversification. You can do risk transfer. Risk transfer is, for example, buying an insurance contract. If you buy insurance, 
the risk is still the same. It hasn't increased or decreased, but it's simply transferred to another market participant and can mitigate limit risk, for example, by setting up limits, a limit system and setting limits to your traders. And every trader is only allowed to do deals up to, say, $20,000. Then you have a limit system in place and risk is mitigated. And we then have fourth, uh, the fourth step, which is risk control. Uh, you review the identified risk every year, usually every year. You check whether you have identified all risk, whether risk popped up that weren't known before. You have to check the adequacy of your measurement uh, models. Um, you have to check the, uh, the success of those measures taken to manage risk. And if necessary, you need to improve your measurement methods. You need uh, to check the um, instruments and you need to do this regularly and to check whether the benefits justify the costs. And last but not least, as a part of risk control, um, you need to communicate the results. Usually your management board, um, also a risk committee, if you have a risk committee um, in your company, they want to be updated on the most important risks, what you have done if you're monitoring these risks and what needs to be done about this, and they need to sign off on your actions. Uh, the supervisory board needs to be informed every year um, about those risks. And in the case of financial institutions, supervisory authorities like BaFin, Bundesbank, European Central Bank, uh, in the United States, the SEC, um, the Office of the Control of the Currency, the Federal Reserve, uh, the F, uh, FDIC, uh, the supervisors and the authorities need to be informed about the risk management process and what you've done. And of course, auditors, public accountants, and in the case of insurance companies, actuaries also need to have a look at risk management. So this is the internal and external communication of your risk management result. And last but not least, you also have the risk uh, report as part of your annual report that is shown to investors and stakeholders. So you have the risk management process. It's still in jam, but you can get the idea. Risk measurement, risk identification, risk management, in German we call this Risikosteuerung, and then risk control, communication, and it's always a circle. It always starts with identifying, measuring, managing risk, checking the ac accuracy of your risk management, and then going back to risk identification. Okay, now um, let's talk about um, the relevance or rather irrelevance of risk management in perfect capital markets. This is actually the same argument as with capital structure. If you've taken a class in financing theory in corporate finance, you should know that um, probably the most important theory we have in finance is the modigliani miller irrelevance theorem of capital structure. modigliani miller theory tells you that in a perfect capital market where you don't have um, Taxation, no taxes, no transaction costs, fully informed investors, uh, and the usual assumptions about a perfect capital market. Uh, that is, no market frictions. Um, capital structure is irrelevant. It has no effect on the size of the pie, on shareholder value, on firm value. Um, increasing or decreasing leverage, increasing debt, uh, doesn't change firm value. So um, in financial theory, we know that capital structure should not have an effect on firm value. Now with risk management, you can do virtually the same argument. And remember, our ultimate goal in risk management is the maximization of the firm's share value. So actually in, well, this is the irrelevance theorem. Um, capital structure has no influence on the firm's value. Um, if the market is frictionless, no taxes, no bankruptcy costs, no agency costs, uh, asymmetrically distributed information, we don't have all this. So if the capital market is perfect, model Yanni Miller tells you, uh, the first theorem tells you, capital structure is irrelevant. 
Now, can risk management create added value for the company's owners under these conditions? Well, <laughs> it's the same argument. No, in a perfect capital market, risk management is also irrelevant. Why is that the case? Well, imagine you have these conditions. No taxes, no bankruptcy costs, no agency costs. What happens is, in the end, um, you have a company A and a company B and A and B um, only differ in the with respect to risk management. Let's say A does risk management and B does not. So what a, um, a person, well, you, you probably know this argument from capital structure. Um, you can have you, you have an all equity company and you have leverage and you have a levered company. What happens is if you have no um, agency costs, if you have no transaction costs, an investor can actually buy risk management. It can invest in a company that does risk management. It can, he or she can invest in a company that does not engage in risk management. So there is no advantage to risk management because in this sense, if you have no costs attached to it, um, in that case, uh, risk management is obsolete. It's irrelevant. Um, so astonishing result in a perfect and frictionless capital market is risk management is irrelevant. The first idea is because we need, at least in these theories, we need to, um, we need to proxy um, for risk management. And what is usually done is in financial theory is that we think of risk management as hedging. Um, we think of risk management as buying a financial derivative. Um, now, if you're not clear about what a financial derivative is, um, a financial derivative, let's define this at this point, is um, a financial contract, can be a security, can be an, um, any financial instrument, financial contracts, um, whose price is derived from another underlying financial contract. Meaning what? Best example is an option. Option is the right but not the obligation to buy or sell an underlying asset, usually a stock. So a stock option is the right to buy or sell an underlying asset, to buy the underlying stock. So if you have an option, a stock option, you can see the price for the option will, oh, sorry, the price of the option will depend on the price of the stock. So that's a financial derivative. And if you use a financial derivative, uh, you can use this financial derivative to hedge uh, another investment. And usually that's what risk management is in financing theory, in finance theory. It's buying or selling uh, a financial derivative uh, for the purpose of hedging. Now this will come at a cost. And if the cost of bearing a risk and the cost of the hedge are equal, the hedge cannot increase or decrease firm value. So actually the costs will, the sa will be the same. And you can do the following. You can go back to the situation of company A and B. So you can argue this is, let's say, this will cost you $5. Or you can buy the unhedged full risk company, but then you will have to bear the risk of $5. Okay, let me go here. So in the end, you can buy the stock of company A 
risk management will reduce firm value by five dollars or you can buy the stock of company B and you don't have the cost of risk management but in expectation you will have the potential risk of losing five dollars so in the end A and B they are the same the diff only difference is A engages in risk management B does not but the firm value will be the same and if you're an investor with a different risk aversion you can simply do okay let's buy 50% of A or 50% of B or let's buy 20% of A or 80% of B so there is no advantage to risk management that is if you're in a perfect capital market however as soon um, actually you can also call this homemade risk management so if um, you have a different risk aversion and you want a different risk return profile uh, you can simply um, buy stocks of A and B in, in any mixture. Hmm? Problem now is, and this is uh, a result that is due to René Stolz from Ohio State University uh, and Graham and Stolz. Um, we summarized this in 2000. The company might reduce the volatility in its share price by reducing its idiosyncratic risk, but that does not mean that its share price will rise. Well diversified shareholders did not notice these idiosyncratic risks before the company reduced them and will not reward the company for action that they do not notice. In the long run, the argument goes, risk management cannot create wealth because it does not increase the company's expected cash flows. It just smooths out the ups and downs in cash flows. So it stabilizes expected cash flows. It can also increase but not under these uh, assumptions. So what are these assumptions that lead to um, this model Yanni Miller world uh, to collapse and that in practice, in reality, um, risk management does make sense? Well, first of all, frictions exist. So what are the consequences? First of all, hedging cannot take place at equal cost within and outside the firm. So it might be that hedging within the company, buying a financial derivative and the bank, most notably, uh, buying a lot of financial derivatives in wholesale reduces costs. So you as an investor, you, it's more costly to you to buy the stocks of company A and B. Then measures of financial risk management can lower the probability of the firm's insolvency. So what is usually assumed is that for example, if this is the bankruptcy threshold, so if your firm value goes below this, at this point, the company is bankrupt. And model Yanni Miller has the same argument that if you have a frictionless capital market, it doesn't matter if you are here, if you are here or here, you are not bankrupt. But in reality, the problem is that in this area here, you start to encounter more and more problems. So if you take any company and you hear rumors that this company is close to bankruptcy, this means that um, you get a worse credit rating, banks will um, require more collateral, uh, banks will be reluctant to give you an extension on your loan. So you have increasing bankruptcy costs. And those bankruptcy costs and costs of financial distress, we call those costs of financial distress, let's write this down, costs of financial distress, those are direct or indirect costs that you will start experiencing in this area even though you are not yet bankrupt. And this might be that, for example, in order to save the company these costs here, you need to do risk management to make sure that you don't go down here, but you can go up here again and that you never come close to your default threshold. That's the argument that you want to do financial risk management in order to save on costs of financial distress. And if you have taxation, we have the argument that actually because of a convex tax um, function in most countries, um, smoothing out profits um, will save taxes. And let's make this argument here. It's a very simple argument, actually. 
and it's the same as in German income um, taxation. Um, in German, this is das Ehegattensplitting argument. Let's assume that you have um, a tax function that looks like this. It's a convex tax function that will look like this. You don't have to pay any taxes, then it goes up and the tax function looks like this. So it starts at a relatively low tax rate and it increases um, with a convex tax function. Now let's assume... Excuse me? Yeah. So widening uh, behind your webcam picture. So what? we are not able to see the whole oh, diagram. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, let's, let's see where I can... Ah, okay. Let's... let's I don't see the OBS feed, so I can I cannot see my own video. So let's do this here. So you have this tax function, and it will look like this probably. You don't have to pay any taxes here. It will increase at a certain income, and then you will have a convex tax function. Now it's the same argument as with the German Ehegatten splitting. Um, assume you have a company and the company can choose between the following two scenarios. Um, it can earn uh, this or this. So you have to pay this or this in taxes. Or actually, these, no, these are the two potential incomes. So this is maybe one million, this is two million. Then you will have to pay this amount of taxes and this amount of taxes with, say, 50% probability. This is probability 50%. With 50% you're here or 50% you're here. So if you take the expectation, the average, you will probably be somewhere here. That's probably the, the average. Now, if you can do risk management, and risk management will smooth out these ups and downs in cash flows, you will probably be here. But with this income, because of the convex tax function, you will be here, meaning that you will have to pay this here in taxes. And this here, this, this is the advantage of risk management. By smoothing out the two incomes here and here, you can get the average from here to here. That's the argument with taxation. Hmm? You can say this in German. This is Ehegattenschlitting argument. Ne? Anstatt dass Sie 0 und 100.000 Euro an Einkommen haben ähm, und das getrennt versteuern, Sagt ja gerade das Ehegattenflöting, sie nehmen einfach den Durchschnitt und sie haben eine gemeinsame Veranlagung. Ähm, ähm, und dann, ähm, nein, Veranlagung, ich gesagt, das sind Veranschlagungen. Ne? So. Und ähm, dann kommen sie in Summe, kommen sie natürlich im Ehegattenflöting, kommen sie dann besser weg. Und das Ehegattenflöting ist natürlich genau dann besonders gut, wenn die beiden Einkommen der Ehepartner, ähm, wenn die besonders weit voneinander wegliegen. Ne? Dann haben sie den größten Steuervorteil. Okay. So that's the um, argument with taxation. Okay. My uh, red color back again. Okay. So that's why uh, risk management is relevant when you have a friction, a market with market friction. Now, Consequences are also, you have agency problems between equity and debt capital providers. We've already seen this with the cost of financial distress. Debt holders will um, force the bank um, and force managers' hands in case you are closing in on the um, bankruptcy threshold. Um, stakeholders might not be able to perfectly cover an increased risk of the company in contrast to shareholders. Um, if you have big non-diversified shareholders, they are certainly interested in company-specific risk. And shareholders are interested in the stability of the cash flows. They want steady dividend payments. 
So many arguments that are due to the market not being frictionless um, that make it sensible for a company to engage in risk management. But just as with capital structure, it's an optimization. You have costs and you have benefits. And every company in every sector needs to decide how much risk management is good and when should I reduce my risk management um, efforts because it is costly. Okay. Now, in summary, if you have imperfect markets with frictions, risk management can significantly contribute to both the increase and stabilization of shareholder value. And this is the theoretical argument, and there are many papers theoretically um, on um, the empirics of risk management. And if you're more interested in this, uh, you should have a look at the papers by Graham and Stoltz, um, and also by uh, Peter Tofano um, in the, I think, Journal of Finance. What uh, Tofano did is he looked at the gold mining industry. Why? Um, you can imagine that in empirical work, uh, the problem is endogeneity. What is endogeneity? It means you have risk, you do risk management. But you have risk management, um, this also has an effect on risk because risk management changes risk. So if you see that a company engages in risk management, you cannot look at risk and say, oh, look, this company is doing risk management. It has a lower risk. And this company doesn't do risk management. It has higher risk. That's a problem. That would be comparable to saying, for example, oh, look, this person has a headache. He's taking medicine. So there's a result. Um, because if you don't have a headache, you don't take aspirin. No? So risk, inc um, risk uh, affects risk management and risk management affects risk. And that is why um, this problem of endogeneity uh, is a huge problem in the empirical analysis of the efficacy of risk management. And in the case of the gold mining industry, and Tufano and some other people look at this uh, in the early 2000s, the nice thing about the gold mining industry is that uh, they only use derivatives. They only use it for hedging, hedging, and they only have one risk, which is the gold price. In a financial institution in a bank, you have market price risk, you have credit risk, you have the risk that the IT system fails, but with the gold mining industry, this is a very good example for a sector that is exposed to mostly one risk, gold price fluctuations. So that's why they looked at the gold mining industry. And empirically, yes, we know from our early work, risk management has a positive effect and stabilizes shareholder value. So this is one slide, I think, from the uh, um, Copeland Western Chestry uh, textbook on corporate finance. Uh, you can see here that actually this is uh, a survey. Uh, this was a survey. And you can see it is always, in at least the literature, it's always about using financial derivatives. And be careful with this. Because in practice, for example, in the energy sector, people will not immediately think of um, the use of derivatives as the prime example of uh, risk management. Risk management for energy companies is rather risk identification, monitoring financial risks, looking at um, some uh, potential uh, losses and measuring financial losses. Um, and um, usually management is just monitoring. They keep a look. Uh, they keep looking at and they keep an eye out for any financial losses that might increase. But the use of derivatives is usually not the first key in risk management in energy companies, only in the very large ones. Why? Using financial derivatives um, also means that you are then exposed 
too heavy financial regulation. You're a financial company in that case, and then you fall under the supervision of BaFin. And many energy companies don't want to be regulated and supervised from the financial supervisory agency, so they don't use derivatives at all. They do different things, but we'll come to that later on. Okay, and you can see here in which asset classes do you use derivatives? Currencies, credit, energy, commodities. Commodities would be, for example, gold price um, or oil um, and equity. Okay. I think this gives you a first good example, a first good impression of what financial risk is, what we'll be dealing with here in this class, and uh, what risk management is, why it is uh, interesting also to look at risk management from a more theoretical uh, point of view, um, and what, some, what the ultimate goal is, it's always about shareholder value maximization or at least stabilization. And in the next section, uh, we'll talk about the different types of risks. As you can see from the outline, we'll start with the basic distinction between financial and real economic risk. And then we'll concentrate on the main drivers of risk in a financial institution. Market price risk, credit risk, liquidity risk, op risk, operational risk, which is something different than the other types. Um, we have two or three slides on actuarial risk to include insurance companies, and then talk about model risk, which is completely different from these previous types of risk. But I would say um, this has been a lot uh, for today, and I would say we can stop uh, here at this point and continue uh, with uh, section two and chapter two next week. And then we'll have some time to uh, see if you have any questions and uh, discuss your questions. Thank you.